Hello and welcome to another episode of Bayview High School celebrating World Mental Health Day. I'm your host Chanze Babar and as student counselors and play therapists we interact with a lot of students. At Bayview High School we recognize that children have emotional needs that need to be met and nurtured in order for them to feel safe and secure and be the best versions of themselves. So today we're going to be talking about a topic that is not very new to all of us. It's something we've all experienced one way or the other regardless of whichever generation we belong to to be honest. Um and for that I have two amazing professionals with me. I have with us Ms. Nirmal Niyazi and Ms. Aisha Jamal. Ms. Nirmal Niyazi is a clinical psychologist and has been affiliated with many organizations as a consultant and runs her own practice by the name of Let's Talk Mind in Karachi. Ms. Aisha Jamal is a psychotherapist and co-founder of the Center of Inclusive Care in Karachi. Not only that, she is actually the pioneer of the first additional learning needs department in one of the mainstream schools in Karachi, Pakistan. Thank you so much Ms Nirmal and Ms Aisha for being here. We're very happy to have you here. And how are you feeling about this? How are you feeling about this episode? Excited? <laughs> yes, definitely. For sure. Yeah. Um so the topic that we wanted to talk about is essentially how parents tend to unconsciously or consciously compare their children sometimes with each other or sometimes with someone else. My first question would be to you Ms Nirmal, what do you think? I mean logically we understand that all children and everyone else for that matter everyone's unique logically we understand that but why is it so difficult for parents to accept it um when it comes to dealing with children like sometimes you have two three or sometimes even four right that's a lot of responsibility on parents and um, they would like to think that one strategy which was successful with a child before in helping them to thrive might actually be beneficial for another child i do believe that parents out of wanting to protect their children wanting to do a good by them try to use same strategies or sometimes communicate in ways that reflect that you know it worked with this child but it doesn't work with you it it implies something is wrong with you but at the end of it i feel it's a very human behavior from a parent's perspective given the fact that having to completely change the way they interact with all of their children can actually be exhausting right so it comes very organically for parents to feel the need to sort of like compare ke okay these are all children coming from us so they must behave the same way but while logically it makes sense but when we are in the day to day movements of things it's very hard to actually remember right so um i think it's a natural response from parents perspective but it definitely doesn't work out it does not work out very clearly yeah <laughs> but while you know what you said that this is a very natural response i'm just curious and maybe you can give your input on it ms aisha that where is it coming from like at the back end of things where is this need to compare our kids essentially coming from okay that's an interesting question um you know it reminds me of uh, one of the training sessions that uh, i had in a school and uh, you know when when we were discussing about the impact of uh, com- comparing children um she came up to me after the training and said that you know i just don't understand you know how else can i motivate a child if i do not compare um and and that was really something uh uh profound yeah uh, because i think um as nirmal said uh, that uh, uh, there's a certain uh, uh safety in in uh, predictability yeah uh, so people like to think that you know this is how we were raised uh, this is how we were uh, corrected or we improved ourselves uh, and somehow uh, this is how it's going to work for our children and uh, not that it worked for us either because we carry that shame till now and it comes it it just seeps in 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 times of pressures um and it's so it's just about helping uh, parents to understand from the place of curiosity as nirmal said first understanding parents like predictability human beings like predictability and we think in patterns and uh, that's why comparing um is is something that we've been exposed to 
so we carry it on and 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 uh, indulge that uh, in the kind of parenting we do with our children. So um, it's just perhaps that's where it comes from. It's, it's Probably generation it's a generation of thing. comparison mm -hmm. and exactly. thinking that this is the way that it works. That's I actually agree with that. That is something like I said. Um, this is a generational thing. Everyone around us, you, me, everyone, regardless of whichever generation you belong to, we've all experienced this. But what? How can we educate parents in identifying their children's strengths um, and uniqueness, or maybe accepting that? Is there a way to do that? Is there a way to help parents look for them, or identify them, or strengthen them? When you're focused on what your child is not doing, right? So when you're comparing, you're basically focused and invested in what your child is not doing. Because you feel that, okay, I did this for my other child and worked for him or her. And why is it not working for my child? So instead of self-reflecting, you start thinking, okay, what's wrong with my child? So essentially what you're doing is you're looking at the child through the lens of uh, he's not good enough, uh, and so very, um, you know. And the child looks inwardly through the lens of the adults around them, right? So if the parent is looking at the child in, from a comparative lens, then um, you know, helping parents understand that this is like this is going to be an internal dialogue for the child for the rest of his life, that I'm not good enough or I'm not as good as my sibling, or I'm not good as uh, my cousin, or I'm not as good as the other child who aces in the subjects in school, right? So it, it's helping parents, I think, from a place of compassion, because we need to understand shaming sort of creeps in, right? Uh, that's what's been done generationally, so we need to do something. If we want to break the pattern, then as educationists, as professionals, mm -hmm. As people who are creating awareness, we need to help parents see that this isn't working, this hasn't worked. So what do you need to do differently? Uh, because instinctively, I think every parent has that capacity. It's just helping them, uh, giving them that strength. You know uh, how to parent. It's just that you know, you've lost track in just identifying what's amiss here. Um, Focusing on I'm what the sense. child does instead of what the child exactly. doesn't do. Exactly. Right? So what I'm hearing is that this is a generational cycle that our grandparents, their parents did it to them, our grandparents did it to our parents, our parents did it to us, and now we're probably doing that with our children. And it does not help anyone. I really liked what the story you shared about the trainee mentioning that, uh, you know, I want to do it to motivate the children. Comparison is needed to motivate them. I would like to get your input on this, Ms. Nirmal, because we also live in a society that it's very prevalent here um, in a cultural collectivist society that we often want to compare each other and then we say that we motivate them. Does it really motivate us? It really does not work. <laughs> it, it really does. does not. Because we need to go beyond the, you know, the typical understanding of what we mean when we say we're motivating. Mm -hmm. There's a whole concept in motivational psychology, like it's a studied concept that internal needs of human beings dictate their behavior and motivate them. Which basically means that every person, when they're born, biologically and through what they observe in the world, actually end up creating their own internal needs. What as parents sometimes we forget is to recognize that um, what my partner's needs might be are actually not mine. What my child's might, might, needs might be might not be their cousins or other siblings, right? And it just takes a second to kind of reflect within themselves to see that their own needs are actually quite different from maybe their own sister, the child's khala, for example, right? So the reason why it actually does not work is because it's the needs that dictate the behavior, not this element of comparison that motivates. So motivation comes from a desire to fulfill internal needs. So a, one child can have very high need for achievement for example, and intrinsically be motivated. And when externally, when we reward that behavior of, okay, you know, you did so well, that was amazing what you did in class. That child's need for achievement, which was innate, gets fulfilled, and they further feel motivated. 
But on the other hand, their siblings' need could be creativity, that they might actually thrive when they're thinking out of the box and they are being curious, right? So when the teacher specifically asks them to act a certain way, it doesn't do much for them. So in order to motivate that child, you would need to be, wow, okay, you know, I really liked your idea. Can you tell me more? Rather than, you know, your brother was doing this and look, he or she brought in A grades and you didn't, the child is going to be least bothered, except for shaming. That's the only thing that's going to impact them temporarily, which we feel is probably motivating them. But that's really not the case. And again, this is so prevalent in our culture, like the word that you use, shaming, it's also in body shaming, grades shaming, everywhere around us. Like we are made to look up to other people who are probably doing better in a certain field. And with the parents in our culture, it's um, actually worldwide, you could say that, that every parent is sort of, they're more inclined towards their children's academics. They're more focused on that. How can we make them, how can we educate parents to focus on other needs as well, other strengths as well, or maybe how to nurture them other than academic strengths? It's also understanding that there are more than, you know, the few in intelligences that schools are uh, normally catered to. Yeah, so the way um, uh, the conventional schools were, uh, they focused on the linguistic and uh, mathematical and logical intelligence. Kids who were strong in these areas uh, were celebrated for 16 years, right? Um, however, now as educationists and you know, as, as there's more awareness, um, it's important to educate parents also that there are more than uh, just these two intelligences, right? And we need to look at the other intelligences as well. So the more space you provide for a child to explore and, and uh, be curious, as Nirmal said, not look at their, uh, them as, as being part of their behavior, you know, separating the two, then, the, then automatically we will uh, move away from the shaming element. And as parents, parent from a place of curiosity, that here's my child with potentials beyond that uh, schools perhaps are able to identify because the school is measuring um, uh, my child's potential through uh, linguistic and mathematical and logical intelligence. So what else is there that my child is, uh, you know, bringing out in them? You, you need to have that eye to look for things beyond those uh, uh, intelligences. That can create that space to, for, uh, for the child to emerge with their potentials and then you can hone those, the things that they're good at. You know, um, like this conversation is geared more towards parents and I just had a thought, I'm sharing it with you. Like we talked about the society that we're in, right? A collectivist society. Most children are usually brought up in a joint family system. So parents are, it's not just parents. We have to be mindful about other people the child interacts with. We are in a very big society. So let's say the parents are very understanding. The parents are very emotionally aware of their um, children's needs and their children's strengths. But how can they protect their children from how other people interact with them or shame them or compare them? That was really like bullseye because absolutely when we're working with families for example we actually ask whether the child is growing up in a nuclear family setup or a joint family setup and um, the next question then we ask while we're working with families is how frequently does the child get to interact with other family members the reason for that is in a household and that's not even true just for joint family but where there is a significant age difference so for example the elder sibling is 18 years old or 19 years old and the younger sibling is 11 or 10 years old right so what happens is that that really older sibling also turns into a parent figure. Same is the case with living in a joint extended family where puppos, chachas, tayas, khalas, mamus, all these people around. Full house. Exactly, a full house can actually take up the role of being parents. And oftentimes parents say that, you know, like I try my best not to say that the color of my child's skin is not looking a certain way, but the chacha or the chachi says something, right? Or the khala says something. 
What's really important for us to understand is that we cannot put a bubble wrap around a child. But the identity of a child, at least till the age of eight, does develop and come from the narrative that the parents carry. So it's really important for us to be mindful of one fact that when we say that, you know, the chachi is saying X, Y, Z to my child, how is it really impacting you as a parent? Because if unconsciously you're becoming really like insecure about your own child's color, and even if you don't say it, it's going to seep in. They're going to pick up on it? They're going to pick up on it. Children actually respond a lot more to non-verbal messages rather than verbal ones. So a way to counter that, a way to provide your child that sort of like a protective shield, because they're going to go into the school also, right? You can't protect their narrative from every place. So what you do is you check in with your own narrative. You see as a parent whether you're unconsciously or consciously carrying that feeling also that the color of the child's skin or the, the grades that they're getting is putting them off also as a parent. In case if it is, you need to do self-work. You need to remind yourself that if you are able to truly see your child as full, the child will eventually pick up on your cues. So one of the ways that we actually encourage parents to do so is actually engage in conversations. So for example, before going to sleep, tell stories talking about, um, you know, there was a bull which was full of um, creativity and agility while the other bull was full of strength and all the bulls were friends, for example, like there's a story um, which talks about it. So stories can be a great way to help children's narrative be more, you know, foundationally strong. So next time, for example, if someone is saying, Ki bita, itte gande marks aap kya hai, such as an aunt or uncle in the household, the child can come comfortably take that, communicate their discomfort and actually talk about it with the parents that I felt XYZ about it. You know, auntie was telling me this, so Amma and Baba can actually say that yes, we understand, but at the same time, we see you. And it is that safe adult, one safe adult it takes for a child's, you know, world to feel that kind of security in, within. And once that's there, the kind of criticism that they're going to meet in the world, which is natural part of the world, because that's also something that parents say, you know, like if we compare kareenge, other people oh will. God. We're just toughening them up. I've heard this right? so many times. We yes. are doing it for their betterment. Yes. What you're not recognizing is you're preparing them for the bad world. It doesn't have to start with you. You can be the safe world that they take within themselves as they face the big bad world that's apparently out there. That can be one of the ways to kind of really address that in a joint family structure. But we really need to be mindful that in extended families, parents also get shamed. So child's grandparents, parents' parents could be telling them that you're not doing good parenting. And then they take it out on the child that you are not performing well. So that cycle needs to break basically in order for the child to feel much safer and more able to celebrate their own uniqueness basically. That was some profound stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone watching can relate with whatever you've said. So what's coming to me right now is that essentially what we need to do as parents is to pause, reflect and connect with our kids and focus on their um, well-being and their strengths and focus on what they can do rather than what they can't do. Ms. Nirmal, this happens so frequently in our practice that we tell parents to limit comparison and then they say that we're just trying to toughen you know uh, our kids out and something that I relate to and what they also additionally say is that some competition is necessary we need to have our children compete with each other or some form of healthy competition or comparison is required um, do you think that is healthy and essentially what is healthy competition uh, so if I could, you know, take the word healthy from the parents' conversation and say that yes, there is a way to do that. And um, uh, going back to uh, what Nirmal was saying, that essentially uh, intrinsic motivation is what we are trying to inculcate in children, right? But helping parents understand that yes, this is great, you want healthy competition, that, that's really a go good idea. But right now what you're doing is you are using shaming to motivate and that's not possible. Yeah? Sometimes, you know, I would even help parents uh, in a session um, uh, say that, you know, just, just to give them a feedback of what comparison actually looks like. 
uh, I would say, you know what, uh, you're not really doing well with parenting, you know, like I don't, you know, that's not a very good way of approaching this. And, the, you know, suddenly I'm empathizing with them when I throw this at them and they go, you know, Shocking. their faces will drop. And, and then you, you ask them, what did you just feel? Uh, and, and then they understand, oh, you know, shame's come in the room now. So helping parents understand that uh, there's a difference between motivation and uh, telling a child that they're not good enough. Yeah. So uh, the more you focus on, um, once you understand, first of all, the difference, yeah, uh, that, that's scaffolding, that's setting a good base. And then uh, focusing on what the child is good at, right? So instead of focusing on what the child is not good at, you start focusing on what the child is good at and help them uh, uh, compare themselves with, with their own past record. So, you know, uh, last time um, uh, you finished this in 20 minutes. Uh, and you know what? Today you were able to finish the same amount of sums in, in 10 minutes. Wow, that's amazing, you know? So the child is not competing with someone else, the child is competing with themselves. That builds their confidence and that builds the intrinsic motivation. And then, as Nirmal said, storytelling is a huge way, is a beautiful way of communicating and motivating children. It's interesting how, uh, you know, uh, the Quran also uses stories uh, to uh, uh, narrate um, uh, stories of inspiration. Like so you essentially to inspire our inspire kids to be a better kids. version of themselves only and not compare them to other people. Absolutely, people's. absolutely. Right. So you can motivate, take uh, famous personalities and help children motivate them that look, this is their life and this is how they struggled and this is what they achieved. I think those are, even t sharing the, your st struggles with children sometimes really helps them see you as a human being. Connecting with the kids is what Connecting is important. With them, Pausing, absolutely. reflecting on our journeys as parents and of course then understanding that they are unique and then connecting with them based on whatever they're good at. Focusing on that would be a good way to start. This is something that we prioritize at Bayview High School as well. We were very focused on students' emotional well-being and we want them to be the best versions of themselves mm -hmm. when they feel um, confident in themselves and they're just at a point of peace with themselves and this is something that we strive for and we hope to achieve that for our viewers as well. So now that we have covered some hard-hitting facts, let's get to the juicy part of our conversation. I wanted to play a game with you guys, all right? And so what I will be doing here is that I will be giving you some statements that parents usually tell their children. And on each statement, I need you to raise a flag if you think it's a red flag you raise a red flag and if you think it's a green flag you raise a green flag so far we're good we're good so the green flag would mean the statement is healthy healthy right mindful and, and red would be like mm -mm. exactly <laughs> <laughs> let's just term it like okay. that parents saying grade 5 will be easy when I was your age I came first in grade 5 <laughs> Can you reflect on that? Why that might be? Because I'm not you. As a child, I would actually be thinking, okay, okay, if it's going to be easy, Baba ke liye it was easy, or Mama ke liye it was easy. Oh my God, am I going to come first also? Because if I don't, then that means that it was easy, and I didn't even do good. So yeah. Too many expectations. Too many expectations, too pressured. Number two, you got an A last time, but this time you got a B. Why do you think that happened? It's a safe it's a, sentence. Yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's from a place of curiosity. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would probably um, be mindful of the tone that I say this in. Absolutely, yeah. And the phrasing oh. of it might, like, just basically not demanding a why, probably, just kind of like, I'm wondering. Okay, what so you can reframe it. Exactly. Like mm -hmm. And this also goes with, you know, what you just said, that 
comparing with your past record and yeah, not with someone else. Absolutely. Number three, you did so well. You got a B after getting a C last year. That's so cool. That's good. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. good. Uh, it, it really does, but if I'm a sensitive child, which I can possibly be, I'll just be mindful of the fact that what am I building up on? Okay, yeah, you know, like, whoa, that's so cool, you gotta be. Is slipping into the fact that I got a C last time really functional or really needed? Otherwise, I think it's a safe So sentence. maybe we could reframe it like, you did so well, you gotta be. That's, so that's so exciting, so cool. yeah? yeah. You, your hard work paid off, like, you mm. work really hard, yeah? Cool. Number four. Why is it taking my child so long to understand math? My eldest is so good at math. For sure. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. I'm not good at math. Simple as that. Simple. Like, I'm not. So it's. I'm not good at math. Math is like an. Hello. So <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think. <laughs> I cannot basically add without a calculator. Absolutely. So yeah. So it's huh. it's like reminding the child that they're not good enough again what Aisha was talking about previously it's about just rec like reminding them of what they're not doing rather than focusing on what they are doing yeah number five a teacher saying why don't you avail ex students help maybe they can help you out with your grades mm, it I'm just it curious could be, huh? hmm. I'm curious to know where it would be coming from in terms that yes sometimes buddying or you know buddy support can actually be a very good healthy strategy which we recommend um, but it really depends whether the other student is being seen as some sort of like a caliber against whom you're su supposed to be comparing so it can actually be a safe strategy the way it's implemented will make it either red or a green and maybe just asking the child, you know, is there uh, some support that you want from your classmates? You know, maybe, you know, empowering them that, you know, is there someone because then they would choose someone that they feel safe with as well, right? And they'll feel, okay, I have a choice here. Statement number six, this is hard for you. I can see that. What do you think can motivate you to do better? So for me, I think this is a safe statement for several reasons. Number one, it recognizes the child's struggle, so I can see that, gives a validation that I'm recognizing it. At the same time, it really depends on the nonverbal communication, whether I'm sitting down with the child or I'm coming from a place of, oh, I know better. Um, but if it's said the way that you just said, it would be very kind. Also, just to be mindful of um, developmentally appropriate language. So for a smaller child, Motivation as a word might be too abstract for them to understand. Uh, instead, they can use, um, I can see that you're struggling. Um, is there something I can do to help you more? Or do you think there is something we can do to do differently? Because that way the child can actually understand it more concretely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I second with what uh, Nirmal just said. I think it's really important how you frame the question. Um, it's not only the words, uh, it's how you frame it. And, and the word better, mm -hmm. uh, like she said, there could, could be, be different better. ways. <laughs> <laughs> right. There could be different ways mm -hmm. in which it can be presented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also the non-verbal cues. Like Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You are overthinking this. Your brother, classmate did it, you can do it too. Did not even need to end, hear the yeah. end of the sentence. It's like a red. A complete and I hope by now you know people hearing this can actually pick up on that themselves that why it's not okay um, simply because you're dealing with a complete different com human being who him or herself is just unique and this comparison is absolutely not going to help them problem solve the situation that's in front of them yeah exactly uh, just to emphasize on the point that whatever you say or do should not put a child in a place where uh, they feel so ashamed of themselves that there is that they are a mistake you know there's a difference uh, that uh, you made a mistake and you are the mistake yeah so I think it's all these sentences uh, whatever you say to your child just be sure that um, you know you framing it in a way that doesn't put a child in a place where you cannot get up from that Place, you know, statement you know, move is forward. very invalidating also. You are overthinking this exactly. and you, know, you can exactly. do it also. Statement number eight. I can see you are struggling with this. Do you need my help? It's a very happy statement, very comforting, um, very safe. 
because it's actually validating the child. It's giving them space to say yes or no if they need the help. And it's giving them the power to recognize that whatever they're struggling with is not something that only someone else can solve on their behalf. So it's giving an option of help and actually empowering them to choose it or not. So I think it's a very kind sentence. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's empowering a child, as Nirmal said, that you know you have a choice there. If you need my help, uh, I'm there for you, you know. Exactly. All right, so that is it for our flag round. Thank you so much for participating and thank you so much for your input. I think what we can take away from this is that um, it all comes down to, yes, your words are important, but it all really comes down to your nonverbal cues and your tone. And uh, coming from a space of validation and acknowledging the child's difficulties rather than comparing them to someone else's journey and focusing on their um, strengths and their growth in a process. I think the viewers and every parent watching can also relate with this and we're so thankful that we were able to discuss these very important things through this platform that was given to us by Bayview High School and um, it's, it's the need of the hour to just simply acknowledge that our children are different and uh, they are completely different human beings on themselves, by themselves, on their own and just to identify their strengths, look beyond what is in the report card, essentially. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so humbled that you guys took out your time and you know you had you were here with us and clearing so many things in such beautiful way. And I'm sure all of our viewers enjoyed and they had something to take away from this. Thank you thank so you. much. Um, on that note, we are going to end today's episode, but don't you worry, we are going to be back with another episode. Stay tuned and watch this space. Thank you so much for joining us.